Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for attending. I know you're out of session right now. Is that right? Out of school anyway. And um, really, thank you for engaging my book. So it's my first time to Australia. And I'm really excited that this ISA conference brought me here because I've met so many incredible people. And I've attended a lot of wonderful things on migration. And I've been really quite mesmerized by the migration um, flows taking place, especially from India to Australia. Almost every young person I meet now is planning to come to Australia. Um, so I, I'm really um, intrigued by this, um, this whole new world, part of the world that I am now discovering. So one of the purposes of my book is really to shift the discussions on global migration um, from only looking at receiving countries to also looking at sending countries. Um, I think if we don't do that, first of all, migration is a global phenomenon, but also I argue that if we don't do that, we miss a big part of migrants' identity. But we also inadvertently depict sending countries as passive agents who simply respond to receiving country labor demand, which of course is very important. But in reality, I argue sending countries also have a very long history of not just responding to receiving country demands, but also proactively controlling who leaves the country, who doesn't leave the country, where they leave to, how they leave, et cetera. So in the book, I trace the politics of sending country emigration policies and practices in specifically to examine how and why the Indian state has managed out migration or emigration from India to the Middle East and to the US across classes from the 1800s to the present. And to do so, I introduce what I argue is a new analytical framework for research on migration that I call the migration development regime, which I'll talk about in a moment. But before I get to that, I just want to start by saying how I entered this field, because one of the moments that really stunned me early on in the research, I come from a labor background. I've always studied Indian workers in India, and like many other Indian labor scholars and labor activists, once a worker leaves India, we basically don't think about them. They're not included in our scholarship. They're not included in our movements. They're not included in our policy. It's a different animal. Um, and so... Uh, for a variety of reasons, I did start inquiring into this um, gap and looking into the out migrants. And I was talking to an Indian government official who's in charge of out migration. And he kept talking about two kinds of passports, two kinds of passports. And I couldn't understand what he was talking about. It's a democratic country, equal citizenship. How can you have two different kinds of passports? And what I quickly learned was that since the early 1900s and still today, India has enacted different laws, different regulations, different practices, and indeed, basically two different kinds of passports for high-skilled workers and low-skilled workers. Um, and this is surprising in a democratic context that purports to give equal citizenship to its um, population. But when it comes to the right to mobility, until the 1980s, India basically forbid poor migrants from leaving the country while elite migrants were free to go and come and go. And still today, poor migrants are subjected to a battery of regulations, restrictions, fees, paperwork, et cetera, where elite migrants trying to leave the country have, are subjected to none of that. Now, I didn't know this, and I had been at that time studying Indian labor for over 20 years. Almost nobody that I have met that falls in the skilled category with the skilled passport knew about this. Um, and that meant to me that all this had happened without any public discussion, any contestation or debate, or even knowledge. And so that got me thinking, why would the Indian state bother to go through this trouble to distinguish its citizens, control its citizens, out migration by class? It's not efficient. It's not cost free. It's in fact quite costly. And I wanted to also know how do the different classes of migrants then respond to this state differentiation? And over time, how is that state migration relationship changed? So 
To look at all that, I first turned to the literature on um, migration, because like I said, I was a newcomer to the field. And that's where I was struck by how focused it was, especially in the US context, on receiving countries, but also in the Indian context. That's a picture of India in the middle there, where even within India, when we look at the sort of public discussions on migration, it looks at India as a receiving country rather than India as a sending country. And within those public discussions, discussions on migration in receiving countries, people's protests, either for or against migration, is always depicted as a flashpoint for receiving state leaders to manage. Um, as we know, it's very much in the news. The Atlantic has called it the biggest wedge in American politics. The Guardian has called migration the greatest challenge that European leaders face. I'm curious how, the, uh, how it's depicted in Australia. But this has bred what Jim Hollifield calls the migration state. And that is the state that has the sole right to manage migrants. And that made me wonder, do sending countries also have a migration state? Have we also given sending countries the sole right to manage who leaves and how they leave and why? Second, within this public discussion in receiving countries on migration, the tensions around migration that are depicted here are always highlighted along racial and ethnic angles. And the class dynamic of migration, I argue, was quite invisibilized. And this was surprising to me because actually the class diversity of migration is more diverse today than ever before in history. Second, the resistance and the racism around migration, especially in many receiving countries of the global north. And again, I don't know if this is true for Australia. I know there were some recent um, exceptions to this, but in general, they tend to quell around low skill migrants, leaving high skill migrants often unscathed or even celebrated. And finally, although international norms prohibit the receiving country migration state, from overtly discriminating and controlling immigrants according to race, we all know it happens, but we have to do it in sort of backhanded ways according to nation of origin, et cetera. What is absolutely uncontested is that every receiving country in the world has the uncontested right to discriminate and control immigration according to class. Every receiving country has in law different rules for those who are in the euphemism for class and migration is of course skill. We have different rules on high skill migrants versus low skill migrants. So this made me wonder how are sending countries then handling the multiple classes of their out migrants and emigrants? I then did turn to, uh, I, I discovered a, a more budding literature on emigration from sending countries, which has grown in recent years. And by and large, this literature does not really look at the state of sending countries. It instead examines how has out migration helped or hurt development back at home. And so broadly speaking, this literature can be categorized as either saying out migration is a development panacea or it's a development disaster. But for good or for bad, emigration in this literature is depicted as class neutral. And it's also relatively ahistorical. It's often seen as a sort of result of this neoliberal era. And yet, as I already mentioned, we know the world has, and sending countries in particular have, a long history of enacting different policies for different classes of emigrants. We know that emigration started long before neoliberalism, and it's also been class-based long before emigration. But yet, unlike in receipt, and this is of course true for India, but unlike in receiving countries, Emigration out of sending countries is rarely a flashpoint for sending country leaders. So in the case of India, emigration is never a topic of discussion in political elections. It's certainly not a group that they have to appeal to in order to get elected. It doesn't really come into public debate as it does in receiving countries. There are some exceptions. The Philippines and Mexico provide some important exceptions. But in the case of India, it is really really rarely discussed. So again, I wanted to look then and uncover and sort of expose what are the class politics of migration in India. Now, interestingly enough, at least in the US um, 
um, world of sociology, although we have a lot of studies on migration, India is oddly absent. Um, and that is surprising. First of all, India is the largest migrant exporter today. Um, and this is sort of an undercount, but over 17 million Indians um, abroad. It is also, as we know, the largest remittance receiving country. And I should emphasize that this amount far exceeds what India earns in foreign exchange from its software exports, which we hear a lot about. This is an enormous amount of money, foreign exchange flowing into India. And it's also the most class diverse stream of out migrants. And what is interesting about its class diversity is that the class diversity presents an interesting puzzle. On one hand, we have a huge flow of very, I use the word poor rather than unskilled, because as Natasha Iskander and others have beautifully shown, what we deem unskilled workers are actually quite skilled. So I use the word poor, and in India, low skilled and poor are quite correlated. We have a massive flow, the bulk of which goes to the Gulf countries, yet the Indian state provides very little recognition and celebration and welfare for them. And the reason I use the word yet is because, in fact, they are the ones that have provided a disproportionate share of these massive remittances coming in. This is with very low levels of wages, yet they're the ones who take up a large percentage of this um, um, remittance share. And I also say yet because it is unlike other receive, sending countries like the Philippines and Mexico that have done a little bit of better job of recognizing this poor out migration flow and the financial remittances coming in. On the other hand, India has one of the world's most elite and largest emigrant flows as well. But interestingly enough, they have actually contributed quite a low level of foreign direct investment remittances and foreign portfolio investment. Yet in recent years, the Indian state has invested heartily in really celebrating and awarding and recognizing these elites abroad. And so the question for me was, if, if the Indian state is not receiving financial returns from its elite immigrants abroad, what, what then are they gaining from them? Why are they investing so heavily in building these relations with their elite migrants? And when they are getting financial remittances from their poor, why are they not recognizing it more and trying to, if anything, encourage it even more? So to look at this, um, these questions, I did an archival analysis of Indian government migration documents from the 1920s to the present. And then I did a whole host of interviews with the national state government officials in India. I did three subnational sites. I did the recruiters, which are only required for poor migrants to leave. And then I did these two classes of migrants. I did the poor migrants going to the Gulf and elite migrants going to um, the US. And as, oh, well, it wasn't here. Oh, let me, did I put a different? Okay, let me just say two quick things about these two classes, just for people who aren't familiar with uh, um, these two groups. So the Gulf migrants in, in the case of India began uh, in um, full fledged, obviously, during the oil boom in the mid 1970s. Now, this was a moment where actually India forbid migration out for jobs even. And so the early um, flow was extra legal or illegal. They were smuggled. I talked to many recruiters who showed me the boats they used to smuggle these people out just to get a job abroad. Um, and these are the groups that are called poor or unskilled. And again, this is in the Indian law. It's the definite or the cutoff point is based on education. So those who have let at that time less than 12 years of education, now they've moved it to less than 10 years of education, are deemed poor and unskilled and therefore have a battery of regulations on them. Um, and because of the receiving country context, these guys go out and they uh, men, and I will get into that, but they go out on temporary visas of, for six to eight years because the Gulf does not have any pathway to permanent residency or citizenship. They uh, have to migrate without families, but they usually return to India facing up to 60% of them facing unemployment. So really they're sort of caught in virtual cycles or vicious cycles, whichever way you wanna look at it, in circular migration streams. They're sort of in and out, in and out. 
Um, and again, as I said, this is the group that is required to go through recruiters. And because of this situation, their organizations that they have formed, I used organizations as my entry point into these workers, the organizations that they form are formed in India because they're forbidden to form them in the Gulf. Um, so they're called returnee organizations. So these were the groups that I um, talked to on the, Indi on the poor worker side. On the elite worker side, um, I compiled a unique database of over 624 organizations of Indian American organizations located in the US that do some sort of work in India. Okay, and then I um, categorize them into these different groups, which I'm happy to talk about. But as you can see, the largest share of them identifies religious organizations. And I want to say two things about these two, the elite Indian Americans. First of all, they're very new. 44% of them arrived after 2010. So we had a small group of Indians arriving in the 1880s in the US. Then immigration was cut off to Asians. We had a new wave, a second wave in the mid 60s. And then we had the massive wave that came after the Y2K issue and the two, post 2000 period. So because they're new, their relations and their connections back to India are quite fresh. They're also the most unnaturalized, that means the group that has had the, the fewest uh, citizens um, of the immigrants are Indians. And that's partly because as maybe many of you have heard, our H-1B visas, which are our temporary professional visas, over 70% of them go to Indians, but they are temporary. And as well, they comprise a pretty big share of our international students. But second, they're exceptionally elite in the US. The Indian community in the US, as you can see, 80% of them are college graduates and their median household income far exceeds any other ethnic group in the US, over 150,000. So this, you can imagine why the Indian government might be super interested in connecting with this population. They're new, they have fresh ties to India and they've got a lot of money. But again, interestingly enough, they're not very reliable on giving that money over to India. But yet, India is still interested. So they're getting something out of them, and that's what I wanted to look into. All right, let me turn to my analytical um, uh, framework that I am arguing for, which I call a migration development regime. So again, my starting question was, why would the Indian state go through such pains to control the mobility of their citizens by class? And if anything, why would they keep their poor from exiting? And a key argument I make in the book is that we need to reframe our examination of emigration practices and policies as a regime. And I define a regime as a set of regularities and practices that enable various aspects of sending country development. So a key actor in this regime is, of course, the sending state, which is at the national level that still has that uncontested right to control its national borders and what goes through and doesn't go through those national borders. And I argue that sending states, including the Indian sending states, although Indian, the Indian government rarely um, concedes to this, uses emigration as a proactive vector to shape its own economy in India, to secure its own political legitimacy within India, but also globally. And finally, to attain consent for de particular development ideologies. And I define ideologies as habits and norms and institutions. So in sociology, we often talk about education and media as important vectors through which we attain consent for particular ideologies. We, we can see, at least in India and the US, a, a sh an attack happening on education and media by the right because they understand that education and media has been used as a vector through which to transmit certain habits and norms and values. And it's being questioned and taken over by another a group of habits and norms and values. And I'm arguing that migration should be included in that um, sort of group, that we transmit and introduce new ideas and new habits through people. Um, and 
The advantage, I argue, of looking at emigration as a regime is that it enables us to highlight the multiple pressures that the sending states face. So on one hand, they have a lot of different pressures that they have to address coming from below, from the different subnational governments, which in India have different interests and demands, as well as the different classes of their emigrants who have different interests and demands. But at the same time, they also have to deal with the competing pressures coming from above, the global forces of employer demand, receiving country immigration policies, and of course, Northern development ideologies. So in retrospect, this regime might appear very neat and clear and rational, but what I try and unpack and trace in the book is that these regimes are only partly national, most, oh, sorry, rational, mostly they're contradictory. They're full of contingencies and therefore we need to re- think about states and sending states in particular as a site of struggle that is constantly changing over time. And that is why I then trace India's MDRs over time as a dynamic thing that changes from the 1800s to the present. And I categorize India's MDRs into three sort of major MDRs that have shifted over time. The first I call the Cooley MDR, which began in 1834. That's the year after the British outlawed slavery, formally outlawed slavery. And then they turned to India for indentured servitude up until 1947, which is the year of Indian independence. The next MDR is the nationalist MDR, which ran till 77. And the contemporary MDR I call the CEO MDR, which is the MDR where anyone can be a CEO, whether you're a poor migrant or a wealthy one. Um, and at certain moments over time, emigrants consent to a particular MDR, but at other moments, I argue, they come together to fight an MDR, causing it to fall and bringing a new MDR in its place. And at certain moments, MDRs just simply reflect the dominant economic ideology, but at other moments, I argue, the MDR itself and the movement of people are actually changing the dominant ideology, the economic ideology. So one can see that the Cooley MDR sort of is reflective of a lot of the institutions, values, and habits of colonialism. But what I argue is that the nationalist MDR, which was the MDR that closed the borders to the movement of people out of India, presaged the development ideology that in India we call Fabian socialism, which closed the borders to the movement of goods and services. Similarly, in India, neoliberalism began officially, we call it liberalization, officially in 1991. But what I wanted to do was dislodge the current type of migration that we have from neoliberalism. And actually I trace the CEO MDR to much earlier than 1991. I argue it started in 1977 because that was the moment when the Indian government started to open its doors to looking at elite migrants, open its doors to slightly allowing some poor migrants to leave. And it was that movement of the migrants that helped attain consent among Indian elites to finally open the borders to goods, services, and finances. Um, so in other words, the movement of people across borders, I argue, has often served as a taste test almost for sending countries who want to also then control the movement of goods and services across their borders. Okay, across these three MDRs, there have been some continuities. Um, across all three of them, they have, all, and this is what I show in the book, have always served as a vector to spread knowledge, ideologies, and practices. The particular type of knowledge and practices have changed over time. All three MDRs have accentuated and legitimized class inequities within India. So although the Indian state acts as though they don't get involved in migration, it's a democratic country, you're free to come and go if you want. What I try and trace in the book is that the Indian state has been quite active and has actually accentuated class inequities through its migration regimes. But the ray of hope is that they have also, at least historically speaking, 
always ultimately fomented a cross-class resistance to a particular MDR, which has caused one MDR to fall and a shift over to a new one. So I end the book actually with a sort of question mark of what might we see in our future. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip through some of this stuff, but just to quickly say that the colonial, the, C, the Cooley MDR was the first MDR to export poor and elite workers as racialized coolies to serve the empire, but it was also the first migration state that in, was instituted at this moment. And that was when we had our first set of class-based migration laws and institutions, and even titles of certain personnel, all of which are still in place today. So this Cooley MDR has a continuity that started under colonialism and is very much present to this day. Um, but of course, it fomented a cross-class resistance and was brought down, and it brought forth the next MDR, which was I call the National MDR. And this was the MDR that forbid poor migrants from leaving the country. And this was in the name of sort of fomenting the state image of being a protector of vulnerable labor. Yeah, I have all these quotes in the books that say, the book that says, we will never be a coolie nation again. This is in a post-colonial moment and this shame of having lived through those hundreds of years as you know, sending our coolies abroad was very much informing the nationalist MDR. And so it was very much to create an image of not only a group that can, will take care of our own poor, but interestingly enough, was also making the counterclaim that we have so much surplus skilled labor to spare that you can have them. Um, and so that was their sort of way to legitimize the contradictory stance that they took towards the elite migrants. Um, okay, and that results in what I call a paternalist sort of protection rather than a rights-based protection. Okay, um, let, this one also fell eventually, but I'll get to that in a moment. Let me just say two, uh, three things about the current MDR that makes it unique. The first is, this is the first MDR where the Indian state has explicitly tapped emigrants' financial contributions to India. And again, this was not easy to do because when we're coming off the heels of the nationalist MDR and the Fabian socialist model, which had a lot of suspicion about any kind of foreign currency, this was a moment where we had to change that suspicion even among the Indian elite. Um, so tapping global finances meant inviting in foreign capital into the country. Now, as we know, as I already mentioned, one pathway of getting that was through the remittances. This is a portion of the wages that the um, immigrants have earned abroad and sending home directly to their families. And this has been a huge success, but as I mentioned, largely coming from the poorest migrants. So what the Indian government also did was they tried to tap more long-term finances from its elite migrants abroad. And the way, one of the things they did, for example, is that they resuscitated an old tax category that was existent from the 60s, had never really been used, and they resuscitated it in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was called NRI, which is a term that many people know today. It stands for non-resident Indian. But I talked to many Indians in the US and they said, well, it used to be, we called it non-required Indian because the way the Indian state sort of legitimized their, their hypocritical stance or their contradictory stance to allowing at least to go is they said, we don't need them. And they turned a cold shoulder to them once they were abroad. They definitely didn't tap them for their money and they definitely didn't recognize their success. But in the late 70s, early 80s, they started to offer these particular packages only to NRIs, and they were very much tapping elite NRIs because they were the ones that would have the money. And they gave above market returns on different packages that were not available to foreigners and not available to domestic Indians, only to this one particular group. And I call it for example, in the realm of foreign direct investment, ethnic direct investment, because one of the things, again, in the parliamentary documents you can see is people said, you don't have to worry that this is a US dollar. It's from our brothers. It's from, again, it really is from, it's a very male dominated thing, but it's from our brothers abroad. These are our people in blood. We can 
uh, trust it. So they also did it were for particular savings accounts and bonds. Interestingly, however, these all of these packages were quite costly for the government, very volatile because NRIs were allowed to pull it out whenever they wanted, and very low. In fact, I was just giving a talk in India, and one of the um, one of the discussants said well, they're actually non-reliable Indians then, aren't they? And so I wish I had known that earlier. So we've gone from non-required to non-resident to really, they really are non-reliable. So then what then is the Indian government getting from them? And this brings me to the second sort of unique feature of the CEO MDR. And that is that the CEO MDR has tapped another resource, a unique resource from elite immigrants for the first time. And that is what I call their ideological remittances. Indian Americans have helped elites in India embrace and practice rather than critique new development ideals of privatization, volunteerism, self-sufficiency, and entrepreneurship. This is a whole new set of ideals and practices, and Indian Americans have sort of become a poster child for many of these practices and, and policies coming into India. And to attract these ideological remittances under the CEO MDR, Indian Americans have formed partnerships with Indian business elites, and Indian elite government officials, forging what I call elite transnational PACs. And in the process, I trace how these PACs have helped reshape Indian businesses, Indian education and healthcare, Indian philanthropy, as far as going into making new tax codes, and as I already said, Indian business development. And in return, the Indian state offers these elite Indians much greater status recognition than ever before. In fact, they are framed as an ideal type of an elite global Indian, one that is successful, hardworking, private sector, professional, and entrepreneurial, and one that domestic Indians should emulate. Um, so unlike in the earlier MDRs, the CEO MDR empowers Indian Americans, elite Indian Americans, to help shape India's future and at the same time valorize their own status within the US where they are facing racism. Um, all right, I will just quickly say a word, and this will be my last slide, a quick word about what's going on with poor migrants. Now, one thing that I found really interesting, so my earlier work, as I said, was looking at informal labor organizations among construction workers. I've done many sectors, domestic workers, automobile workers, et cetera, in India. So when I looked at these migrant organizations, migrant, poor migrant workers, who are also in construction, by the way, largely, are also organizing into organizations, but they're not joining Indian trade uh, unions. They're forming these returnee migrant organizations. And like, similar to what I found with my informal workers, they too are using the power that they have as voters to attract state attention to their needs. And that has been quite successful at the sub-national level, slightly less successful so far at the national level. But rather than framing themselves as labor or workers or through class identities, they frame themselves as economic heroes. They put a lot of energy into showing the data or collecting the data and then publicizing the data of how much foreign exchange they have brought into the country. They also say that, look, just like war veterans are protecting India's borders abroad, we are protecting India's financial reserves from abroad. So we are economic heroes and it is true true, it is those financial res exchange reserves that have helped India through multiple financial crises. And they're saying, we deserve credit for that. That was coming out of our wages from abroad. And the, so what are their demands? One of the important demands that they make is liberalization of migration. And that's something that I emphasize in the book that when we critique migration or especially labor migration as something that is harmful and exploitative, which is all true, 
Stopping migration is not the solution. It was in fact the poorest workers in India that fought to liberalize it because the Indian state didn't deliver on its promise of protecting workers locally. So their demand was to liberalize it. And that is why we have to remember that liberalization has very solid support in India, not just from the Indian American elites, but from poor workers. So we need to understand some of that solid foundation. Second, they asked for rights-based welfare. They're still asking for welfare, but not this paternalist protective one that says you can't leave the country. They are the reason we have the data that we have. They have pushed hard for more visibility and data. They want recognition and dignity, but again, not as Indian workers, but as economic heroes and as entrepreneurs. And finally, they also want a portion of their financial, the foreign exchange reserves paid back to them, because that is a policy that the Indian government gives to exporters. When they bring in the software exports, bring in financial exchange, uh, sorry, foreign exchange currency, the software exporters get a portion of that. And so they're demanding a portion of that. And I already mentioned the um, similarity of the army. But overall, one thing that's important to just emphasize here is that the migration, the CEO, they've largely consented to the CEO MDR. This is not yet a moment where they're really critiquing the CEO MDR. They still see a space for them in it. And they are trying to be entrepreneurs and volunteer. They see themselves as, um, when I talked to the unions, they said, oh, the migrants think they're better than us. And I thought I'd go to the migrants and they would say, oh, the workers think they're better than us. But they didn't. They said, we are better than the local workers. They really do think of, feel themselves as more cosmopolitan, more traveled. They think they're more hardworking. They feel the domestic workers are lazy. So there's a, a complete separation of the migrant identity from the domestic workers identity. 